Coming up this week, Shopify CEO issues a stern warning about the use of AI in product development that could have a profound impact on the rest of the industry. New research from Microsoft suggests that relying on AI tools at work could come with some unpleasant side effects that you'll want to be aware of. A new analytics tool that uses a radical new UX pattern that you won't want to miss, plus the latest data trends and new tools you can use at work. Stay tuned for all of that and more. And if you enjoy the briefing, hit the subscribe and the like button. But first, Google Workspace is getting a new feature called Workspace Flows. This is designed to automate multi-step processes like updating spreadsheets. In a blog post from Google's VP of product, she explains that users can simply describe what you need in plain language and Workspace Flows will design and build sophisticated logic-driven flows. Workspace Flows actually use something called GEMS, which are custom AI agents that you can build using Gemini to handle specialized tasks. So these tasks could include things like checking if marketing copy fits your brand voice, reviewing policy documents before approving a request. And Workspace Flows can refer to your files in Google Drive for context and then use these custom trained gems to take the right next steps. This was all unveiled during Google's Cloud Next event. And as part of that, Google also announced that Google Sheets is set to get another new feature that's set to arrive later in this year, which is called Help Me Analyze. So if you've used Gemini in Google Sheets, you'll know that its functionality is pretty limited. So Help Me Analyze will be built directly into Google Sheets and will allow users to create interactive charts as well as spotting trends and providing guidance. So if you're a fan of Google Sheets, then that's something to look forward to. Microsoft also hosted a major event of its own with a co-pilot event which unveiled a bunch of new features. And in many ways, this was Microsoft playing catch up since the event included many of Microsoft's own versions of already established features like deep research and even a notebook LM style podcast feature. Perhaps the most noteworthy of these features though was Copilot's new browser agent called Copilot Actions that can perform actions on behalf of users. So some of these actions included multi-step workflows that use some of Microsoft's own AI agents, including a project manager agent and facilitator agent for meetings. And speaking of AI agents, AI coding startup Devin, remember them? They've unveiled a linear integration that can work through your entire product backlog, or at least that's what they say. The integration knows your code base, will comment on each ticket in your backlog in a few minutes, and these comments will include a summary of your current code, an implementation plan, and any edge cases or questions that might need your attention. The CEO of one company that's already using it says that since the feature was announced, they've used Devin to raise 17 pull requests and they've merged three already, which is pretty impressive. Amazon also released its own new agentic features this week with the release of a new Buy For Me button that allows users to use their Amazon shopping app to purchase items from third-party websites on their behalf using AI agents. So essentially, this allows users to buy items from third-party sellers without ever leaving the Amazon app. So in this sense, third-party sellers will be more than happy to generate these additional revenues. But the question here is, is eroding a direct relationship with their users a price worth paying? And does this mark the future of payment journeys where AI agents actually purchase things on our behalf? This could have a profound impact on the UX of payment journeys. And if the UX of payment journeys is something that you're interested in, Head over to Substack this week, which is where I take a deep dive into the payment journeys of some of the world's leading companies. So in this analysis, I take a look at all of the UX of payment journeys from companies including OpenAI, Miro, Midjourney, Adobe, Duolingo and more, along with some key trends and emerging themes that are worth knowing, as well as one payment journey that was so confusing that it triggered legal action. So there'll be lessons that you can learn from this if you're interested in designing payment journeys for your product. In other news this week, Instagram is finally fixing one of the most unloved product features, which is search. Despite research showing that 45% of Gen Zers are more likely to use social media for searches, the search feature has been pretty much untouched for the past decade or so. And Instagram's head actually admitted this, saying that searching on Instagram is just not very good. And speaking of search, Hacker News this week invited users to share their own experiences of how they use search in the post-AI world. Now, clearly, this is a tech-centric audience, so it is biased to some extent. But here are some of the key themes and takeaways. Users said that LLMs are preferred for open-ended research and convenience. So users use LLMs for clarifying technical concepts or summarizing unstructured data. And a key advantage of them, of course, is that they're conversational in nature, but they still rely on search engines for real-time data, navigation, and any information that needs to be 100% accurate, given LLM's hallucination concerns. The overall feeling here is that a hybrid use of these tools is more common, where people combine LLMs and search engines based on the task they're trying to complete. But all of this could have a profound impact on the way our brains approach problem solving. Stay tuned for some research on that. 
and let me know in the comments below. Do you rely on AI tools for search or are you still using traditional search engines or like the folks at Hacker News, are you using a hybrid approach? Now let's take a look at some tools you can use. First up is an analytics tool called Metabase. Now, if you're not a massive fan of the recent rollout of Google Analytics 4, then this could be something worth taking a look at. And the reason I've picked this is because they've actually introduced a new UX pattern, which is quite interesting and intuitive, which is something called drill throughs. So drill throughs allow you to click on a graph or a map of information and then drill down into more detailed analytics of that specific piece of data that you're looking for. So if you're looking for alternatives to Google Analytics, then Metabase is something worth checking out. Next is a product called Glass. So if you're somebody who finds themselves highlighting chunks of text as they navigate the web, then Glass allows you to turn those highlights, whether it's from Google Docs, from your browser, from your personal notes or books that you're reading, and then convert those highlights into an AI clone that you can then have conversations with. And the final tool this week is a company called Sherlock. So since the rise of remote working, one problem that's plagued many tech companies is the proliferation of cheating in a remote setting. So Sherlock is designed to stop candidates from cheating in remote interviews. Sherlock works with Zoom, Teams and Google Meets to make sure your interviews are safe and reliable. So it has a bunch of proprietary technology which detects AI assisted cheating by monitoring people's devices and detecting audio patterns and conducting visual analysis which can identify if candidates are reading from off screen sources or exhibiting patterns that are consistent with external help. Now let's take a look at some data and trends for the week. And first up is this new study conducted by Microsoft, which suggests that using AI tools like ChatGPT at work is making us lazy thanks to something called cognitive offloading. Now, I first came across this in an article over on the Wall Street Journal, where one of the scientists involved in the concept of cognitive loading referred to a previous study which showed that using devices like GPS can essentially mean that we offload our cognitive processes to machines, which can make us less competent at those tasks. So in this study, users were asked to perform different tasks and were then asked afterwards whether the use of AI made the task require less effort or more effort. These tasks were core critical thinking tasks across things like knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. And as you can see from this graph, the vast majority of people across each of these critical thinking tasks said that using AI required either less effort or much less effort. But there is one important caveat here, which is that in some use cases, like software engineering and product development, participants said that using AI actually required more effort as participants needed to double check the output before relying upon it. So if an engineer uses AI to generate code, initially that's much easier, but if you then have to wade through that code to ensure that it's accurate, this can actually be more effort. So one of the participants said that the extra effort in determining that the code generated matched my existing code and making subsequent alterations to make it fit was actually more effort than just doing it myself in the end. So this study is an interesting one for highlighting the limitations of using AI at work and its potential impact on our cognition abilities. But one person who is very keen on the use of AI in the workplace is Shopify's CEO. So Shopify's CEO has told all staff that AI must be part of the product development prototyping phase and that all teams must ask themselves the question, what would this area look like if autonomous AI agents were already part of the team? So in this memo that was published over on X, he says that using AI at Shopify is now a fundamental expectation of everyone and that AI must be part of the prototyping phase, which could have a profound impact on how other product teams approach product development. What do you think? Do you think he's right to say this? Do you think he's right to say, well, all companies should now be AI first and using AI during the product development phase or not? Let me know in the comments below. This week also saw the annual Stanford University AI Index report get published. And despite all of the concerns around AI, users are actually becoming more optimistic about the use of AI in products and services. So in countries like China, Indonesia and Thailand, strong majorities see AI products and services as more beneficial than harmful. But in contrast, optimism remains far lower in places like Canada, the US and the Netherlands. But sentiment generally is becoming more optimistic over time. So even in low scoring countries like the US, they've seen a plus 4% shift in how users view AI since the last report and a plus 8% shift in more positive attitudes versus 2025. So if you're interested in learning more about the impact of AI on a global scale, then check out the Stanford University AI Index report. But not everyone is as optimistic as that. MIT has published a new piece of research this week, which says that the AI startup character.ai, which allows users to interact with AI avatars, now receives 20,000 queries per second, 
which is around a fifth of the estimated search volume by Google. They say that AI companions represent the final stage of digital addiction and that the rise in these tools could have a significant detrimental impact on users. So if you're interested in the ethics of AI, particularly from a product perspective when it comes to things like character AI, then check out that report. And finally, if you've ever had to implement privacy legislation like CCPA or the GDPR, then you'll know how difficult it is. And this week, it was announced that Europe is taking steps to simplify the GDPR, which is Europe's flagship privacy law, as it seeks to deregulate and make it easier for tech companies to do business on the continent. That's it from me for this week. Thanks very much for watching and listening. And I'll be back next week with another briefing.